quite a complex product. Um, there's somewhere between 700,000 and 900,000 lines of code, depending on how you count it. And I don't understand all of it. In fact, since I've joined the project, the number of lines of code have roughly doubled. So I definitely don't understand all of it. I haven't kept up with it. Anyway, we won't have time to go into all the guts of it, of course, but I'll summarise a few of the parts I know, and of course, there'll be breaks for questions. Let's start, though, with a bird's eye view. It's developed in C++, and it uses a product called Qt from Trolltech, which is a portability library. Um, basically, Qt can run on all sorts of things, like embedded things, like this control, for example, could run Qt embedded, or fairly dumb Linux embedded systems, and there's Windows, there's Linux, there's Mac OS, um, there's a few others that are being worked on now because Nokia has bought the Trolltech people. But we don't really care about that now, we mainly care about Linux and I care about Mac OS. Myth TV is basically client server. Um, the server records your TV programs and the client is the bit that you actually watch everything on. Whenever you talk client server, people always want to know, well how do the client and the server talk to each other? These are mainly people who care about standards. Um, fortunately, the client and the server protocol doesn't use anything standard. Like you can't go to a website and say, oh yeah, this is the standard interface definition, and here's the version, and here's how I, how I can write my client to talk to a backend. So that annoys some people, mainly the Windows developers who keep trying to write little clients who want to talk to our Linux backend, and we keep changing the protocol and adding things, and they keep complaining. But that's Windows people, and I don't care. Uh, there, there, there's a possibility of changing it to things like Corba or some of the other um, standard object parsing things. But basically that's a really big change and none of us want to do it. It'll be a lot of hard work and there'll be very little gain. Basically we've got something that works, it's worked for six years and there are other things now that can I guess replace that custom protocol. So you've got a lot more flexibility now without having to re-engineer the whole guts of MythTV. So it's basically, the protocol is basically a bunch of C structures that are squirted down a TCP IP port and there's some tables in a database. Um, people have had to talk about how they look up tables for doing things like the MythTV web stuff or even having to look in there to have a little thing when you log in on Linux that says um, it's currently recording blah blah and blah and your wife will get angry if you try and recompile a kernel right now so don't do it. Basically people have had to reverse engineer the SQL tables and work out what's happening. But I won't do bore you any more details of the protocol itself. We're lucky in that now there are lots of different clients you can plug into with to be out back end. So there's universal plug and play which is originally a Microsoft standard but it's basically a good thing for having little standalone hardware products, like uh, there's D-Link does lots of DVD players that have a UPnP port on the back. It's an Ethernet port, you plug it into your home network, it'll go out and find all the UPnP servers. So there might be a, a Myth TV server there, you might be experimenting with other sorts of things, so you might have a, a little hard disk array that has all your recordings on it, or find some stuff on there. You might have a little torrent client, which um, can be downloading stuff you know, while you're asleep at night and your little UPnP hardware player will go and find the, that illegally downloaded TV stuff. So you've got lots of options there and MythTV is now one of the things that fits in that sort of solution. There's also a product called XBMC which was originally an Xbox client um, but now it's also working on Windows, Linux, um, Mac OS, etc and it supports some versions of the MythTV protocol natively, as well as UPnP. And you've got options of running Myth front end on lots of things, like you can, I put it to the Mac. Um, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on Windows if you try hard and you've got the right versions. So basically the good thing about this is you've got lots and lots of options. You can have a really low power back end just with a tuner card or a USB thing, and it could be, you know, running on 60 or 80 watts, uh, running in your garage somewhere. And then the things that actually use a lot of power in your house, so uh, a butt-kicking PC with you know lots of little displays on it and the ability to transcode everything in a single bound, you only need to turn that on when you actually need to. So you can save power with all the way less CO2 to breathe, it'll all be good. 
Ooh. Okay, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. So here's a fairly simple sort of setup. You might have a big Myth TV box. It's got a few tuner cards. You've got a display and a remote or a keyboard. It's got a database. It's got the server part, the client part, and it's got some media somehow on a big disk, hopefully. Um, you can bring on your laptop and connect out with Myth front end. It interacts with the client, sorry, with the server process and with the database. Or you can have some other mystery box. It may be an Xbox, it may be your PMP hardware, whatever it is. Um, it could be a Mac Mini in your bedroom. Um, who knows? But basically you've got, but that's what most people will have in their home. But you can go to something a little bit more complex. So you can have your main box, then you can have a second box, which has also got a tuner card. The wife says, I'll record three things tonight. You grumble and find a card and shove it into a spare PC and quickly build it. And then magically for that night you can record three things. Um, yeah, that's all for that one. Um, but most people just have the simple setup. So you've got one box, it's got some tuner cards in it. Connects to the interbe internet usually for getting your listing information. You can get it in Australia now over your DVB tuners, but most people use a grabber of some sort, Shepherd or um, some bit of pearl you've hacked together that trolls websites or whatever it may be. So basically all these, you've, you've got the basic processes though. You've got the, a server of some sort, you've got some clients that interact with it. If you've ever looked, had a bit of a snoop at what is happening on your machine when it's running, um, this is my home box when it was playing back a HD recording. Um, you've got your, your client which is doing most of the work, you've got a back end which isn't doing very much at all, you've got a database, you've got some user interface stuff, squirting some pixels to your screen and doing whatever. If you actually press the H key in top in most Linuxes, you get a bit more detail. You find out what threads are running. So the front end there, there are five threads doing a bit of work, the back end's doing about six. But even that's not a lot of detail. So if you use a top on a different operating system, like in this case Mac OS X, you can actually get a thread count. So Myth front end in this situation had 16 threads, just a playback TV. And the back end had, uh, where are we? 14 threads. So it, it's a pretty busy little, little system in there. And I bet you're all wondering, what are those threads doing? Is anyone wondering that? Ah, oh, excellent, audience participation. Well, I'm glad you asked that. I'm going to start summarising. <laughs> so, it, let's look at the back end first. It depends on what you're actually doing, but even if the back end's sitting there doing absolutely nothing, it's not, it's not recording at the moment, it's not rescheduling programs, you've got a whole heap of threads there. There's a thing there which is sitting around looking how full your disks are. Um, Every two minutes it checks how many live TV recordings there are, and if there's too many, it'll start deleting them. Um, it also looks for other recordings, not just live TV, at a, it uses a complex algorithm to work out how often it should auto-expire those recordings. I think it's at least every half an hour, but the algorithm's complex and I haven't looked at it in a while. There's also a recording scheduler. So you might have a couple of hundred rules of all these programs you might have watched in the past. Maybe now they're on TV at the moment, they're all in the database, the schedule has to go through them all, look at, okay, what's in the upcoming recordings for today? Um, have any of those program listings changed since the last time I ran? Has the user added any new recording rules since the last time I ran? So that's a pretty, pretty busy part of it as well. Uh, what else have we got? Oh yeah, there's five threads here which actually listen to requests. So I mentioned there's that custom protocol earlier. Um, some of the things that custom protocol does is very quick, like how much disk space you got. It does a, it does a quick OS command and sends it back um, immediately. Uh, some of them take a lot longer. Uh, it might be, what's the load on this machine? And depending on what Linux kernel you've got, that could be nanoseconds, milliseconds or half a second. Um, so some of those take a long time. Some of them take a really long time, like start streaming this recording to me and it might be a couple of gigabytes of data which it's got to transfer. So the back end has five threads which it basically keeps in a little queue of some sort that 
depending on what sort of how long that actual thread takes to execute, um, there's always going to be something there to serve your next request from MythWeb or from your other clients. At the moment, it doesn't. It's just got a default of five. Um, so I haven't tested it in a while. But if you run enough things, um, one of your clients will say, cannot connect to the Myth TV backend. Um, I'm actually not even sure it's used configurable at the moment. So I think it's hard coded at five. But I could be wrong. It could, actually, it could actually grow magically and shrink magically. It's been a while since I looked at that part. There's a housekeeper. I don't even remember what that does. There's a job queue. OK, so we are talking about transcoding before. Job, jobs are basically things, processes that run on finished recordings. So you've just recorded three gigabytes of TV. You might have an automatic transcoding job to shrink that down to something uh, that you can actually watch on your iPhone and watch it on the way to work, on the train or whatever. Uh, you might have jobs for doing things like automatically locating commercials so you can edit those out quickly. Um, I've had mixed success with the commercial detection, so I don't bother doing it. There's all sorts of other jobs you could do too, and I'll talk about those a little bit later on. There's a HTTP server. So there's a port, well there's a number of ports on the back end, but there's a port you can just do a telnet to, and it gives you a quick summary of what the box is doing at the moment. Uh, it's load, upcoming recordings, current recordings, and a couple of other things I can't even remember. Um, that's very handy. Just remember the port number, do a telnet to it, and you've got a little HTML page there. That's also used for a few other things. Um, basically, I'm lying when I say these two are separate. They were integrated about a year and a half ago. So there's actually only one server which serves up both HTML and XML documents. Let me get out of the way so you can see better. <laughs> um, and there's another useful bit um, called the UPnP media. What that basically does is it sits around and every 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it has a look at your media and builds a new list of files. So if you've got your UPnP client, it'll magically know what the recordings are at the moment without having to use the custom protocol stuff. It's just a, a standard thing. It looks through your SQL databases and says, now he's got 19 recordings. Oh, now he's got 20. Oh, now he's got 15. It presents those in an XML document to your UPnP clients. Um, yeah, okay, while we're recording. So this is just, say, the 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. They're the 12 threads while the back end's just sitting there idle. When you're actually recording, it gets even busier. So we've got a, these are actually all mostly class names. So if you would look in the source code, they're the names of the things if you can read C++. I can always read C++. So it's useful to have those up there. You've got a TV recording class. Um, it's probably going to be writing data to the disk, so it's got a threaded file writer. Um, there's some sort of recorder class under that. Uh, NUPA was mentioned earlier. That's usually used for analog recordings. Uh, most of what we do in Australia is DVB, so there's a different sort of class for that. But in, under recorder class, there's also a, an audio thread um, separate from the video. And there's also a VBI thread for doing things like teletext or closed captioning or stuff like that. In Australia, we've got, on digital TV, we've got program guide data being downloaded or being sent all at the same time. So there's a scanner process which tries to interpret that and shove it into your database. So you don't actually need uh, an internet connection. You can have a freestanding Myth TV box and it will get TV Guide fairly well. Um, there are bugs in that, but we're slowly working on them. Some of the TV recorders have a signal monitor. Uh, so you can see how strong the signal is you, while you're getting, or your wife can see how strong the signal is while you're climbing on the roof and rotating the antenna to point towards the best transmitter in the area. And when a client is playing, so you've got your myth front end and your back ends over there, there's a process actually transferring the file a chunk at a time. Um, that's sort of like an offset and a, a chunk of data situation. And there's things that actually go, go away into the recording and grab a steel frame for previews. OK, I've just said a heap. Do we have any questions about all that verbose list of names up there? Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, zero point, oh, most people I guess are running the current stable fixes version. Um, that has a few bugs. It has in particular a nasty one where the IoT scanner can go infinite loop. So if you turn that on and your back end starts using 101 or 102 percent of CPU, you'll know what's happening. Turn that feature off. Uh, SVN, so the, the, the trunk version of the source code is a lot better. Um, about four weeks ago it was merged in from a branch and there's about nine bug fixes and I think about four of them with the IT scanner and about five with a deadlocks in video playback stuff. So there's some good stuff there if you're brave. No, I don't. Um, I think I think the IT scanner has a bunch of hacks for different countries. Um, I don't know how good it is with UK listing data, I'm sorry to say, and I'm not sure how good it is with all the other little features they try and cram on top, like for Freeview and stuff over there. Um, but, okay. Yeah. So I must admit, I don't use that part. Um, I, so I haven't encountered the 100% CPU situation and, yeah. Anyway, uh, yep. True. Good point. I'd, I've forgotten the name of that class. I haven't even put it up there. MHEG M M is the, yeah, that's the name of the general class. I didn't think that was actually the one that's running in the recorder. Yeah. Anyway, I could look at the source code and find out the name, but it doesn't really matter. <laughs> We've all got problems. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, very annoying. Um, you, you can mention, and, and I've got I've got three courses now to go, so perfectly appropriate to mention it. Okay. Um, mo most people. Uh, no, I don't have it here. Okay. EIT scanner. You're you're subject to whatever the broadcasters send, and if you've, as you've mentioned, they actually change their mind a lot of the time. So that, that's one of the reasons I don't use it. I use um, the free TV guide, uh, there's, sorry, there's community guide in Australia. Um, some people run some illegal grabber scripts, but then people go in and hand edit things. So if there's programs you're interested in, people like me go in for, for the wife or for myself, I'll go and I'll say, okay, that isn't actually Top Gear SBS 19th of January 09, it's actually Top Gear season 12, episode four. So, um, in the future when season 12 episode 4 is repeated, it's not going to re-record it because I've actually made sure the description's right. Okay, so that's why I, I don't use the IT scanner. Um, there's a strategy in the code of the IT scanner to try and do some smart matching and for the situation you've just uh, reported. And there's also some code in it to try and not clash with downloaded uh, from the internet data. So you can do things like use the EIT scanner on all the channels, but then t it can, your internet grab data can have a, a priority over it if you like. So that's handy if there's gaps in your grabber, for example, for the HD channels, but the, the, trans the, the broadcasters actually transmit data for the HD channels. But that said, there will be clashes. Um, my advice is to use the scheduled recording screen often. There is actually yeah. some stuff underway which can tidy a lot of the clutter. Mm. Uh, there's an extension called Synergy Time that's been implemented in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, it's in the process of being implemented in New Zealand where EIT data contains two extra fields ah. which contain a uh, program identifier, a season identifier that one runs for it, and a
Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Of course, we're in Australia whose TV industry is a bit backwards, so we won't have that for seven years. And when they do implement it, no one will be actually using broadcast TV. We'll all be using IPTV of some variety, I'm sure. But who knows? <laughs> You're a man of great faith, friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're watching um, what's this uh, new thing? Uh, the Good job the scheduling Myth TV runs frequently, huh? <laughs> we probably should. Oh, I've got more to go. Okay, let's look at the Myth front end. Um, it's a little bit simpler, thankfully. There's control elements, so you've got um, the thing with the, well, the thing that does the menu with the buttons on. You press the button with your remote, it goes and does a function. There's network control, so there's a TCP IP port. You can tell it to it, or you can use a little TK client and press some buttons and you can control your actual Myth TV box on the other side of the room. Uh, then we've got, oh yeah, that's right, there's this one as well. Um, that isn't implemented yet, but one of the nice things about UPnP is that it's not just client server, it's, there, there's some peer-based functions as well. So you can have a UPnP server which offers up media for a UPnP client or media renderer to actually play. And then you can have a third device in the house controlling it. So in the future maybe you'll have a nice little touchpad like this and as you're leaving for the day you can press pause on your touchpad and it will actually pause TV on your UPnP enabled Samsung Series 10 massive whatever it is. Um, and then you can come back in the afternoon and press play and you'll be playing exactly where it was. So UPnP, there's a control protocol. What this class will do will mean that basically your front end will, will respond to those protocols. So you could pause every TV in your house using UPnP, for example. Um, you wouldn't have to do an individual client connection to all of them. It could do a broadcast UPnP pause and there's, yeah. Anyway, that's not working yet, but it'll be nice when it is. <laughs> um, You've also got some little threads that drive uh, status stuff. So if you've got a nice little case with a, a little two-line or a four-line display that says the time and date and what's recording sort of stuff, there's a thread driving that because sometimes that's a little bit slow. If you've got an Xbox, not many people use Xboxes pl for playback anymore, but there's a little thing that flashes the status lights for some reason. Someone thought that was important for the code at the time, they did it. There's a thing called the media monitor, which uh, I've actually done a lot of work on. It's probably the bit I've done the most work on in MythTV at all. 
and there's still bugs in it, but basically it monitors media. For, so you've got a USB key that you plug into your computer. Um, it looks at what volumes are on it, what petitions, sees if there's anything it can comply, that Mr. V comply, all the plugins comply, hopefully jumps to the right plugin to actually play those. Uh, it does things like multiple, multiple CD or DVD drives. So if you've got a case with two DVD slots like I have at home, um, you put a DVD in one and it can jump to a DVD player and start playing that one. You can put a DVD in the second one and it'll jump to the DVD player and start playing the second drive. So you don't have to, you know, dev HDC, dev HDD, separate commands, whatever. Uh, you can have one eject button on the screen. You press it, it'll pop up a thing saying, what do you want to eject? Uh, Minna from Mars, um, or was it Life on Mars, if you got that burnt to a DVD? Um, I don't know, what's another movie? Yeah, you can have four or five movies there and it'll, tell, it'll ask you which one do you want to pop up and eject. Or you might have your digital camera. Um, there'll be a button to eject that or unmount that. So that's always what's in the Myth front end. Then you've got a few e extra things that are happening while you're playing back things. So there's a TV class, which is like about 3,000 lines of C and does lots of things. Um, it's basically got a thing called a player context, which does most of the decoding of the audio and video. Um, there's a separate class in Myth TV which does some synchronization stuff. Um, there's an on-screen display thread, so uh, you can have a pop-up message. Uh, basically, the phone could be telling you that it's ringing and you should pause the TV and answer it. Um, or you could have a pop-up saying a status thing, someone's at the front door, or it could be the disc that you set to burn. Um, has just finished. Do you want to stop and watch it now? There's, I don't even remember what MHI stands for, but I think it's the interactive class uh, for the for the MHIG. Maybe I've got the class names around the wrong way. And there's a picture-in-picture -picture thread, or several picture-in-picture -picture threads in the Lowe's version. Basically, there's a, there was a revamp, which means instead of just one picture-in-picture -in, -picture in the top left-hand corner, you can have multiple ones on the screen now, uh, just to really annoy your brain or your wife. I, I think it's only got one audio at once, so there's still focus on one. Uh, but there's threads for doing that. <laughs> yeah, there's other threads there. If you remember the count from my, my top command, there was actually 16 threads in the myth front end, and there's not 16 up there. Most of the rest are things like event loops, um, doing things like key presses, threads waiting for mouse gestures. So recently there were touch screen and mouse gesture things added in, which means that if you start a touch and move your, your finger and lift it off somewhere, there ha actually has to be a thread that monitors where the start and end is, what direction it went, how long it was. Uh, so some of that gesture-based stuff can take a long time or it could just be a quick swipe. There's a thread to monitor it so it doesn't interrupt your playback or, or your or menu anima animations or whatever it may be. Okay, there's also a database. So I mentioned client, server and database. There's a database in MythTV. When I first started developing, or actually just trying to compile MythTV, I thought this was ridiculous. Why do I have to have a, a database just to watch TV or record TV? Can't it use flat, flat files, uh, just config files that I can edit easily? Um, I've since come around to seeing the wisdom of having a database actually on your TV uh, appliance. Yeah, you've got to have a database. Sorry, it's just the way it is. <laughs> Uh, we now have to have version of My MySQL version 5, basically because some of the commands that we use in MythTV use particular bindings, which you can't do in MySQL 4 anymore. The way MythTV interacts with the database is through QT. That annoyed me a lot at the start as well. So when I, when I first built a MythTV box, you know, compiling for a day and a half, compiled my QT, compiled the myth front end and the back end, tried to run it, it said, couldn't find a database. So I did my first post to the developer list saying, what the hell's happening here? And they said, uh, did you compile QT for SQL support? No, I didn't. <laughs> so QT has a plug-in architecture for the databases that it's connecting to, and I hadn't read the FAQ that said, you have to compile this thing and install it or configure QT so that it uses it just so that all the code that uses QT can actually use the database that you want to use. So this is a, 
uh, strong early frustration when I was trying to compile and develop MythTV. Database location, that's also something I've done a lot of work on. So it used to be you had to edit a text file called MySQL, and there's a number of paths there where it's located. Um, you can also configure where it's located using a historical thing called settings.txt in the current directory. But now a lot of it's automatic. So if you run 021 or later, you don't have to have a, a configured MySQL. If everything's on your local host, so it's just one machine with all your stuff on, it'll all automatically start up and work. If you've got a remote machine trying to connect to it and your SQL database is set up to allow, uh, so the security isn't buttoned down so tight that your machine can actually talk to it, your front end client via UPnP will locate your back end. Your back end will tell the front end here, okay, I'm using a database at this IP address. It'll connect, log in, and all ma automatically configure. A question? It passes the authentication details. So you might think this is a bit insecure. No, 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 you're allowed to think that. Um, there are restrictions there to prevent that. So if, if for example, we had a MythTV lab here, and we say we had 10 Myth backends all running, I could plug my thing into the network and run it, and it would ping up a little picker that says database 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or actually backend 1 through 10. So I clicked on a random one, number 5, that the person who set that up had a clue and left it at the defaults. My front end would say, this backend doesn't have a pin set, a, a, a login pin set. So a lot of MythTV has a, a four-digit pin that you've got to use to get into areas. Uh, that backend by default is, is so secure that it won't share the, the database login details with the whole network. Um, that said, I recently added a hack to the front end so that if it uses the default of the database called MythConverge, the login called MythTV, the password called MythTV, it'll just log in automatically anyway. I figured that the loss in security was worth it for the, the more magical it just connects and works for most people. But if you've actually buttoned down your SQL database and changed any of those things, like the password, then that, that magical picking process, or if you've only got one client, the automatic selection of a backend and logging in will not be able to connect. So there's your, your, dat your MySQL database will be secure in that way if you choose to have it that way. Is that sort of, okay. I have, you're right. So. Okay. Okay. I, I spoke too many words and didn't think. You've got two sets of credentials. So you've got login credentials for your SQL database, which the back end knows about. It's using them basically. That's what it will share via UPnP if it is allowed to. But by default the back end isn't allowed to. By default your there's a field in your SQL database settings uh, backend pin, I think it is called. Um, if that is set to 0000, which is the default value, then your front end will get a message back via UPnP saying, your back end doesn't have a pin set. Please set one. Okay. So I think that's the way it works. I'd, I'd have to do a test there. I've, yeah. So by, by default, it's secure. Yeah, I think if you erase that 0000, so there's no pin whatsoever. Maybe the other way around. Maybe got to set to zero 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 to allow it. But basically, the default situation is your backend won't won't send your credentials back. It'll send back an error message, and you've got to do do an additional step um, to allow those possibly secure SQL database login credentials to be shared with your network. So there's still security there, but. If you, again, as I said, there's another hack as well that I put in recently. So if your database uses MythConverge, MythTV, MythTV, then it'll connect to it anyway and it'll work magically. So if you're not hugely security conscious, it'll just magically work. That was probably enough about the actual database connection process. But yeah, basically, I'm proud of this because 
there's a lot of, there's a lot of newbie questions about how to set that up and now you can have something like a a CD, so like maybe a Nopix, uh, Not Myth, whatever CD, you can put in a random PC, boot off it, and it will, if you've got a back end running in your home network somewhere, it'll connect and you'll be able to see if you can watch TV in high def or whatever on this random PC you've just shoved a boot CD into. That's quite nice. UPnP is a UDP protocol. So it's not a port per se. Um, okay, there is a port, but it's not. You can't do a telnet to it and get status and sort of stuff like that. <sighs> ah, okay. I actually don't know off the top of my head. I'm sorry to say. For, for questions like that, I usually look on the wiki or do a Google. <laughs> 1900. I think that's the standard UPnP port for most devices. So, if you've had, if you have any UPnP devices in your house, you probably would have had to already enable that on your router. Um, and that is true. But if you want, yeah, that is true. Okay, we've got a chicken and egg problem here. Oh no, kill the chicken, smash the egg, move on. Okay. I talked a bit about how the database connection happens. What's in the database? Well, basically, what's contained in the database is called a jargony term of a schema. That basically is the list of table names and their structure. So are they char fields? Are they short ints, long ints? Um, what sort of language or encoding is in it? The schema, most of the schema is versioned. So there's a setting in your MythTV database that says schema version number 1234. Um, and if you run a newer client and it tries to connect to it and says, oh, this database has an older version of the schema, it'll ask, do you want to upgrade it? And then you've got to think and say, will this break anything? Maybe I should just escape right now and take a breath. Indeed. Indeed. And hopefully you've run Myth backend um, first before you're running a random front end to upgrade it. But not always. There is an expert setting that actually lets you use the current version um, because the developers often swap between stuff and I hated having to have multiple databases in multiple machines. So a lot of the time I'll use a new version of the front end with an older version of the back end. Fingers crossed it's been okay, but always have backups, guys. <laughs> so there's versioning. Um, backups. MythTV automatically does backups these days. You connect to a, an older version of the back end it churns away for a while and you think, has it crashed? But then it brings back a little window that says, uh, you're using a new version of the front end, do you want to upgrade? Yes. A backup has been created in file, blah, blah, blah. Do you still want to upgrade? This may cause problems. Yes, no, exit, whatever. So there's a GUI confirmation. That saved my butt a couple of times, particularly when I added the UPnP stuff because I then had my new front end randomly connected to a few of my test back ends. And if I wasn't careful, then it was upgrading them when I didn't want them to be upgraded. So that was, that was a handy feature. Yes? Yeah, you'd think so. That'd be sensible architecture, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it does. Yeah. You'd you'd think so. Um, yeah. <laughs> for 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 performance, um, the front end connects directly to the SQL database. Um, for simplicity. The code, when you start up the front end, checks the schema and then says, do you want to upgrade it? Um, maybe you could put in a, a, a bug, bug fix suggestion thingy that says, hey, maybe, and then we'll just all ignore it for six months, or say, uh, yeah, a feature request without a patch, and then we'll just delete it automatically. <laughs> okay, the database has two sorts of things. There's 
there's data which is backend specific, actually your master backend specific, things like recording rules or where some of your media like your music or your videos or whatever are located. So when I say master backend specific, your Myth TV machines, you've got a SQL database and you've got at least one backend. That backend you could say owns that database, but not for the purpose of upgrades, but it owns it. So there's data in there which is specific to that backend. Then there's stuff which is host specific. So maybe you've got a second backend, a slave backend, which also does recordings because you don't have enough tuner cards in your first one. So there'll be fields in there that actually have the local host name. So there'll be tuner cards for the master backend, say they've got two, and then there'll be a third tuner card for your slave backend. And the only difference, like they might all be the same tuner card, number one, two, and three, but the only difference will be the host name, um, backend one, dot local, backend two dot local, whatever your, your host name's called. Um, but the, the main thing why there are host specific settings are for the front end stuff. So I can connect from this to my machine at home and I'll get a particular window size. I use my machine at home, it's got a bigger window because it's connected to a projector. Um, I might have a different theme on this. Maybe this laptop's a bit slower than my, my home server. So I'll have a simpler theme with less animation, less depth, less pretty pictures. The, the good thing about the database settings is they can be very easily overridden. So most of the back end, uh, sorry, most of the myth processes have this minus O argument. And you can take an arbitrary setting, so I want to invoke my, my front end in a window today instead of taking over the screen on my laptop. There's a simple way to do it. And the, also the good thing I like about having the database, which I didn't see before when I liked the idea of config files or text files, is that you can do things like this from anywhere in your network. So I could, I could from here, find out what the settings are on my home Myth TV box quite easily. Um, I find, I now find something like that, like it gives an ugly SQL table depending on what version of SQL you've got or if you're using a GUI client it's a bit nicer. But I now find that a lot easier to investigate problems um, than it would be having to trawl through an XML file or a text file or you know, DOS format or whatever thing you're using. Um, yeah, I can use a, a powerful SQL tool or a SQL client with pretty windows and clickable and sortable columns or whatever than my hypothetical, this is stupid, why do we have to have a database for this product? Random question time again? Ex yeah, excellent question. Did I have a comment on that anywhere? No, I didn't. Oh, yes, I did. Okay, so basically that's what Isaac started with. Um, about a year ago, he got his brother to do some experimentation with MySQL Lite. At times in the past, people have tried Postgres. I think it was Post... Yeah, I don't know what version of Postgres it was. Um, basically, all of those were found to perform worse than MySQL did. Um, since that finding, we've basically, well, we could have done something really stupid. Um, I don't think any of the developers are purely database gurus and particularly not comparative database gurus. But basically, we decided from that point onwards, well, SQL, it's a bit big and bloated, but it does work well. And yeah, we're all about the performance and not having to change things. So now, as I mentioned before, we've got MySQL 5 specific bindings in the code and it's going to be very hard to make those database independent in the future. Yes, my knowledgeable friend. <laughs> yes, we could. Uh, one of the reasons... Sure. Remind me that at the end and I'll make a note of that. Um, I, I have no strong opinion on the storage engine of SQL. Um. <laughs> mm. it, it doesn't reboot and rebuild kindly, kindly or quickly or friendlily. Okay. I, I have had uh, that, well not actually tripping over the power cord, more 
idiot kids in school holidays have switched off our metre box or whatever, or we've had a brownout. Yeah, uh, and my box doesn't either, but I've actually had no problems with it coming up again. I had more of a problem with the FISC on one of my uh, recording directories not, not being happening in time and not mounting in time, so recording's winding up in a wrong place in the file system. But I've actually never had any MySQL uh, boot problems in that. Yeah, let's. Sure. A myth to be a power user, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, that, that's impressive. I've heard of myth to be used in dorm situations where like one guy has set up a myth to be a box and then like you know fifteen or twenty rooms worth of university students have started using it. But yeah. that that's impressive for a home situation. <laughs> Constraints and relationships. Um, you've seen about the universal of the like why is it called flat file? Yeah, 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 yeah. When you actually look at the database schema, it may as well be flat file. You're right. And there seems an incredible amount of data that could be normalized and could have decent relationships amongst one another there and those types of files. Yeah. As I said, none of the developers are database gurus. Um, in fact, I think we must have all failed the database classes at uni. <laughs> but that said, we are slowly making changes for those sorts of things. I, I guess that there's an inertia problem in that it takes a long time to make those big sorts of changes and that is a very fundamental change. So the S there are SQL access statements sprinkled throughout, let's say, 300,000 lines of code. Um, that, that, that's a pretty scary change to make and we all want to do other things like bug fixes, like you might call that a bug, but uh, basically it usually works. But that said, uh, with 0 0.20 big changes are made with the DVB database tables. So five of those tables are combined into two. Um, that's not quite normalising, it's more simplification, but it's slowly happening. Yes, we had. Um, so more, more along the lines of when we were looking at different databases, can we support different databases? Um, yes. Yeah. Rather than the so libs. Well, no, no, the, there is a, a standard call for doing the channel list in the libmythTV directory, and but, yeah, 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 I understand you, I understand you. Well, Anyway, we should probably move on, but feel free to submit a patch for that because that sounds like a great suggestion. <laughs> uh, okay, database tables, there's about 90 at the moment, depending on what plugins you've actually used on that database in the past. Probably too many, but yeah, I, I troll through the name of them and I use about six regularly in terms of editing things directly. Um, you'd think that the developers would have a really great way of documenting all this since it's so complicated. We don't. But there, some people have done the hard work for us on the wiki. There's a link. I won't bother jumping to it now. Those tables. Um, recordings I often edit directly because, well, my, my wife is a school teacher and she takes a lot of stuff away on DVDs. So we use MythBurn and MythArchive now a lot. Um, recordings, there'll be something the guide called blah. My wife says, could you retitle this to this instead? Because I think it's actually this series. Grumble, grumble, type, type. Okay, done. Um, 
program, which is where the guide data is downloaded into. Um, occasionally the guide data is wrong. Um, because I use a community based one, there is the option to go to those websites, edit it before the next full database run to update the data. But sometimes, because that run only happens once a day, sometimes I can't be bothered setting up anything. So I'll go and directly edit the program data, mark this as HD, um, change the episode, whatever it may be. I'll record it. Um, again, my wife often asks me, um, there's this showing, but it seems familiar. Have we watched this before? And because of the vagaries of the scheduler and you know, one character different in the description might mean that it's a, a different recording, so I'll try and re-record it. So I'll go back and look in old recorded to see is there something of this same title and a roughly the same description recorded before? Yes, okay, we recorded it before. We can delete it instantly instead of having to watch it or burn to a DV or whatever. Channel, I often look in that because I can't remember the channel numbers. Um, so at home I use, I think, 1104 is channel 9. No, 1004 is channel 9 and 1107 is channel 9 HD. I've now memorised those, but can I remember the same for channel 7 and 7 HD? No, I can't. I often have to look in the channel table. No. No, no, because, so in the database there's a channel number, which by default on Mr. Vis installs started on 1000. Yeah. Yeah, and they're, they're used in ugly places, so I have to look at that occasionally. I should print a little piece of paper and stick it by my laptop, but yeah. Video metadata. So if you use Myth Video, and a lot of people don't because the, it's just a horrible interface, but I still do a bit. Um, so I'll download random torrent things or whatever it may be, and they'll have a place on my Myth TV box. Um, when I've actually watched it or when I've uh, downloaded it from somewhere random and it's actually something different to what I thought it was, I might keep it and go in there and edit the data. You can do that with the remote if you try hard enough, but much easier to do in the table. Job queue. The, the job system in Myth TV is getting better, but there's some error checking and status stuff that isn't there. Occasionally there'll be things in the job queue that I have to delete. I'll go in there and delete an entry. Okay, I've got about eight minutes for six slides. Uh, we had a bit of a talk about transcoding and stuff before, but there, MythTV started with the ability to transcode things and to do commercial flagging, but then it became a more of a generic user job system. So you can have a job which uses the same sort of interface as MythComFlag or MythTranscode, but to do other things. So I've got one at home, I can do info on a recording and go to a job and say, burn this to a DVD right now, rather than having to go into the Myth Archive plugin, select the recording, select the theme, select whether to use the commercial cut list or not. So I've just got a job, it's quick and it's a lot easier than jumping around the menus if someone's at my house and said, oh, can I get a burning of this? Uh, okay, uh, give me seven minutes instead of give me eight minutes to navigate through the menus. Um, we've met, we had the iPod one mentioned before, it's a really good example. If you have one of those little gizmos and you want to watch stuff on public transport, so you want to be able to quickly uh, transcode something or download something to an iPod. Um, one I use a bit at home, my wife, because she's a school teacher, she watches things like BTN or TTN, which are summarised kids, uh, public uh, event news sort of stuff, and they'll have maybe 15 stories on it and my wife will want to say, okay, I want to cut this one out and this one out and this one out. Um, so the, the editing stuff in Myth TV lets you edit things fairly easily for commercial breaks and stuff, but it doesn't have a facility at the moment for saying, I want this clip to go to a new recording and this clip to go to a new recording and this clip. So I hacked together a little thing that basically does, it's a two-line shell script that does a transcode to a new file name and then in brings in the, the markup list. So I can take that TTN, copy and transcode. So my wife will go in and edit around the clip she wants, go to the menu, copy and, copy and transcode. When that's done, go back in, change the edit markers to the next clip she wants to extract, copy and transcode. On the wiki there's a nice little page that says um, how to customise user jobs and some people put up some of their jobs there. Perfect uh, situation for a wiki, people share stuff. Love it. 
<coughs> okay. I mentioned at the start, Myth TV is a large project. I did a count of just the C and C++ source files, not the headers, not the XML, 700,000 lines of code. 900,000 if you count some of that other stuff, which is in the realms of open office. I don't know if you've ever tried to compile open office. It's scary. I mentioned at the start that it's, that it's based on a product called uh, QT by Trolltech. The other major things uh, are FFmpeg, which is a free codec decoding library and some utilities, and f in terms of what I use, DVD nav, which is very handy for jumping around in menus um, of copyrighted or non-copyrighted DVDs. Um, there's some other stuff which I don't use much at all. So there's this interactive TV stuff that we might get in Australia one, once upon a time, but uh, New Zealand and, and England customers are lucky enough to be able to use. There's some sound stuff um, based on being able to play recordings faster or slower than real time, being able to change mono recordings to stereo or surround in some ways um, or vice versa. Um, again, I, I don't even have time to experiment with half of this stuff. There are features that creep in since I became a developer and I just haven't, haven't had time. So the code base just crawls and creeps and grows and yeah, the question. <laughs> goes to. <laughs> You'll have to stay for my next talk <laughs> on, on Myth TV development. Anyway, Myth TV is a complex product. Uh, there's a arbitrary bottom up sort of a dependency graph. Um, yeah, we don't really care about pretty pictures. Okay, you want to know roughly where the line count goes. A lot of it's in the FFmpeg stuff. So there are about 80 codecs, I think, in the current version that we've got a copy of. Um, that's an awful lot of things you can decode. Myth TV can't actually use all of those. So if you plug a digital video camera into your Linux machine, you can play that back in mPlayer. You can... Um, I'm not sure the control stuff, how the control stuff works, but you can basically have mPlayer play data from your DV cam stream. Um, Myth TV can't do that yet, but it can do lots of other stuff. Um, there are codecs in there for ob, uh, vorbis audio formats and all sorts of stuff. I don't have time to keep up. Eventually Myth TV will use more of that stuff, particularly in things like Myth Music. Um, but at the moment, we, we have a, support, a set that are supported and work fairly well for transcoding and for playing back. Um, Basically, you've got blocks there. Yeah. Libraries. Yes. Actually, that one should be in its, little, uh, its own little box. So those five are all FFmpeg based. We don't use the post-processing library or the software scaling library yet. So scaling on Linux usually happens with XV. Um, Post-processing, we have our own set of filters. So there's a kernel deint, deinterlacing filter. There's greedy and yadif now. Um, there's a few others that I never use. But FFmpeg also now has some libraries for scaling and for post-processing of some sorts. Uh, eventually, someone, de one of the developers will get an itch and they'll scratch it and will support all that stuff as well as internal filters and what have you. But for now, they're imported into our source tree they don't take up much space, doesn't matter. Oh. Oh, okay. I wasn't aware of that. Right. Yeah, cool. There's a there's a patch at the moment to use lib Lib uh, FFmpeg, so our libav blast stuff for Myth Music, um, which means we'll support about 40 different audio formats. That'll that'll creep in the next month or two, I predict. Anyway, uh, in terms of code, the next biggest thing is LibMyth TV. Um, that's a, a rabbit warren of stuff that does recording and interactive and lots of syncing with threads and deadlock avoidance and stuff. Um, yeah, it's scary in there. I don't like to go in there. And the actual programs like your Myth front-end, back-end, database, they don't have that much in them. 
Um, there's some user interface stuff. There's some construction and destruction of objects. That's about it. Nearly there, guys. Plugins. At the moment in plugins, there's about 122,000 lines of code. Um, that, that's starting to get large. Basically, the, it's a simple interface. It's just a library call. You've got a shared library. You've got four functions for, for initializing, running, destroying, and setting up each of your plug, uh, plugins. Um, Perl and Python APIs have been demonstrated. So someone did some sort of bridging and some libraries so they could use Python. Perl hasn't, there hasn't been as much interest in it, which is a shame because I prefer Perl to Python. So I love it. Java is also possible. Java allows a C and C++ bridge. Uh, and for this sort of interface, it's very trivial. It's just four function calls and some translation of objects. But I haven't had motivation to play with that. No one else has. The other thing about plugins is they are not asynchronous. So in the menus, you select a plugin. The most of the front end doesn't uh, dies. Basically, there's a few background threads that are running. But all the control execution in the front end goes to the plugin. You're in myth plugin run. Until the plugin returns, the front end can't do much. So that, that's bad from some points of view. It's good in terms of stability and simplicity. Myth Music recently had a, an ugly, ugly patch which allows you to play music in the background. So if you exit Myth Music, it now asks you, do you want to keep playing in the background? Yes or no? Hmm. If you say yes, there's a, some sort of weird background thread that I don't understand. If it dies, your Myth front end hangs. That's why I don't like this patch, but someone applied it. It's in there now. We'll fix it eventually, bug-wise. Oh no, I've gone two minutes over time. Delving deeper. There are mailing lists. Um, but first I advise to search the archive because a lot of the things you might be interested in implementing or just understanding how it works have been asked before. Next resort will be ask questions on those mailing lists. Always start with the user list unless you're talking about class initia initialization sequences and that sort of stuff which is really low level. Next best thing about uh, delving deeper into the guts of MythTV would be generate the Doxygen documentation. Um, they're the commands to do it if you have Doxygen installed. Otherwise, there are websites that you can look it up. Or you can ask me. Depending on how busy you are, you might get no response for a week. Or you can ask me right now and I'll do my best to answer. Last slide, some useful URLs. So there's the mailing list archived. I'm actually... with the, indeed, it's, it's a fairly busy list, but from what I've seen, it seems to be fairly helpful in terms of the community approach, so that, that's great. Um, but I'm on the developer list, I'm also on the FFmpeg developer list, I'm also on digital TV developer list, uh, yeah, too many lists, mailing lists. Um, there's Daniel's, uh, I think nightly builds the developer documentation. Um, so if you if you can't be bothered running Doxygen locally and having it churn away through those 700,000 lines of code, which takes about half an hour for me on this machine, um, for a just quicker look up on something, you go to that link and, oh, let's do that now. If I can drag my browser across. No, oh, no, that's not the site. Looks like my URL's long, wrong. Okay, forget that. Um, but yeah, it, it basically shows all the hierarchy of classes and lets you click a link and go into the source code where the method is defined. I, it's been very handy since Daniel added that. And there's some documentation in the custom protocol, which probably no one cares about anymore because we're all going to use UPMP plugin front ends and back ends, right? <laughs> Yay. Well, I've gone over time. Um, any last minute questions? No, fabulous. Thank you.